right, I think yeah. we'll probably get started now. Um, hello, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us today for our panel discussion on the state of gene editing technologies and CRISPR. My name is Marlena Moore, and I am our marketing manager here at Kineticos. Just wanted to share a little bit real quick about Kineticos. We are a specialized management and consulting firm serving the life sciences industry since 2007. Our firm focuses on corporate strategy, business development, and commercial execution, identifying opportunities that deliver innovative solutions, driving strategic growth for our clients around the world. I'm going to kick it over to Phil. He is our president and chief operations officer, and he is going to be our moderator for today. Thank you, Marlena. And again, I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us. As Marlena said, I'm Philip Galinas. I'm the uh, now president and chief operating officer for Kineticos. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, is start by welcoming our panelists. Uh, we've got uh, four great people that are going to be talking on this topic. And um, first and foremost, I'd like to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about what they do and the organizations that they work for. Uh, I want to start with Dr. Rodolph uh, Barangu. Uh, Rodolph, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, Philip, thank you very much, and uh, good morning, maybe good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rodolph Barangu. I'm a, a professor at NC State, distinguished professor at that. I'm also the editor-in-chief of the CRISPR Journal, and I've uh, had the privilege to be the founder of five different companies in this space. So uh, my lab works primarily on the characterization, understanding of risk gas technologies and their use in the microbiome space and the viral space. Uh, but as the editor-in-chief of the journal, um, I can talk about therapeutics and I look forward to the Q&A and the discussions for sure. Okay, thank you, Rodo. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Dr. Oscar Segarado. Uh, Oscar, you wanna introduce yourself? Thank you, Philip, and thank you for having me. <clears throat> I'm Oscar Segarado, Chief Medical Officer of ASC Therapeutics. AC Therapeutics is a gene therapy and CRISPR therapy uh, focused company. We are working in hemophilia A and we have a second generation recombinant factor eight transgene that we're using for both programs. So we, start to, uh, we expect to start clinical trials in early 2021. I've been uh, for over 25 years in clinical development leadership roles at uh, large biopharma such as AV and Beckton Dickinson, and CMO at uh, several genomics, cell and gene therapy uh, biotechs over the past eight years. I'm a physician scientist with background in immunology and molecular biology. Okay, thank you, Oscar. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Dr. Bruce McCready. Uh, Bruce, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Bruce McCready. I am the former Senior Vice President for Cell Therapy at Precision Biosciences, a gene editing company that uh, is based in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, I was with Precision from 2015 till the very first of this year, 2020, although I continue to work and consult with them. Uh, I'm an immunologist by training and have been in the drug development world with both small molecules, biologics, and now cell therapies for the last 11 years. Um, so. I'm an old guy who's been around long enough to have seen a lot of great technology come and go, and I think this one's here to stay. Thank you, Bruce, appreciate that. Last but not least, I uh, would like to have Shalesh Mangi introduce himself, so Shalesh. Uh, thank you, Philip, and thank you for inviting me on this panel. I, uh, clearly, I'm gonna be the least qualified out of everyone here, and I, and I, and I, I uh, hope to learn as much as uh, contribute. Uh, I'm chairman and uh, founder of Connecticut's uh, uh, we started uh, in 2007, um, and uh, in addition, I teach at the University of North Carolina Keenan Flagler School of Business as adjunct, adjunct faculty. I'm on the board of a number of companies. Um, uh, one of the ones that Rodolph started, uh, uh, Locus Biosciences, which is a local CRISPR company, uh, CAS3, based on Rodolph's technology out of NC State, uh, uh, and then also Aranta Bio, which is a CDMO in the um, uh, microbiome space. And, uh, and lastly, um, I just recently started a um, uh, IO company um, uh, in April, and then we've licensed our first technology out of UNC, which is a novel CAR-T program. Uh, it has a novel co signatory signaling domain. Both are silent there, and uh, you'll 
we'll be learning short more about those shortly. Hopefully. Okay, thank you very much, Shalash. So guys, why don't we get started uh, with our panelists? And again, we're looking at the state of gene editing and uh, gene editing <laughs> technologies and CRISPR overall. I do want to note right off the uh, right off the bat that uh, we will try to save uh, at least ten, if not fifteen, minutes of time at the end for Q and Q and A session. Uh, as Marlena mentioned, feel free to go ahead and enter your questions in the uh, Zoom chat box and. Um, if those questions are applicable to uh, the discussion at that time, we'll, we'll try to introduce those questions into the discussion. Otherwise, as I said, the last 15 minutes, we'll, we'll have a Q&A session. So with that said, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of jump right into it. And uh, I'm sure everybody would understand why we're having a panel discussion on gene editing and, and also specifically CRISPR. So, you know, with the Nobel Prize being awarded in chem uh, chemistry to CRISPR, all eyes are on the future of CRISPR and gene editing as a whole and how it will be purposed to develop uh, needed therapies. So uh, the first topic we wanted to get into is where are we now with the development and application of CRISPR and other gene editing techniques and you know, what diseases are best targets for CRISPR in gene editing and, and what's the work that's currently going on? Uh, I'd like to open this up and start with Rodolph, but to have the other panelists uh, join in as they'd like to make comments. So Rodolph? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the Nobel is the, the topic of the month, right? In, in many ways, it's very momentous, it's very exciting. Um, I think it, it is unquestionably the, the strongest endorsement we can get of this tech, as you said, that is very promising, has huge potential. Uh, it's yet to be unraveled fully, but it's it's very strong endorsement, and, and it's, it's reflecting the fact that this is really a transformative, revolutionary technology. I heard someone already from the panel say it's here to stay. It is here to stay, right? And, and I think this reflects that. There's a lot of excitement, and I think where the biggest impact it's going to have is, is nudge uh, awareness and endorsement by the public. We'll get to that hopefully in the Q&A later. Uh, I think to answer your question about, you know, where are we right now and, and what's next and what diseases should be in play, uh, the good news is we're in the clinic already, right? And not only are we in the clinic, but there's a lot of coverage of some of those clinical trials. So the, the Victoria Gray story for sickle cell disease, the first ever dose patients in the world, uh, single dose, you know, curative dose, and, and um, uh, no adverse effects a year later, right? So I think there's a lot of excitement with early POC, and we see that the, all the early players, the first generation CRISPR startup companies, whether it's CRISPR Therapeutics or Intelia or Editas, right, the first three that went on the NASDAQ, all three have dosed patients already. So the speed at which it's moving along, how far it's moving along, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, I mean, there's like literally dozens of FDA-enabled visible INDs who are recruiting or have announced plans to recruit um, in a number of diseases. And besides those startups, you know, we know that big pharma is in the game, right? The Regenerons and Vertexes and Novartises of the world. And it's not new, right? It's following up the great work that Sangamo and Pacific Bio and others have done in the past. So I think we are at the clinical stage. There's a lot of promise, there's a lot of excitement, but we cannot trivialize the technology, right? It's one of many modalities in play, and the challenges that have been here pre-CRISPR are still relevant, right? Uh, the right delivery modality, I'm sure we'll talk about that today, and I think also um, uh, the right target. And, and to ask you a question about diseases, you know, right now from a tech standpoint, you know, it's good enough to go into the clinic, but efficiency and specificity and controlling repair and doing that in vivo is still a challenge. There's a number of technical things and improvements that are needed still. There's confidence, but they're still there. And when it comes to genetic diseases, I think it's obvious first generation products will focus on single gene targets for which we know what we want the edit to be. So that's why sickle cell was number one, DMD is on the list, and, and, and a number of other single gene based gene therapies. Um, uh, are at the forefront, right? And it's going to be hard to do multiplexing. And the limiting factor, as far as I'm concerned today, is not really technical from a CRISPR standpoint, 
Um, it's more in terms of delivery. And that's why we see people working on um, diseases for which modalities are figured out, like blood, like muscle, like eye, um, to some extent, and obviously the liver. So I think, you know, um, for the foreseeable future, the first generation products will be based upon cases and diseases in which it's not just a single gene and we know what delivery is, but number three, you don't need to edit a large number of cells to have a therapeutic effect. So I think that's why we're seeing some of those early screens, some of those early strategies. I'm always confounded by the fact that so many people work on a sickle cell at the same time. Not everybody can win, but we can discuss that too. Um, but I think, I think we have to wait for the results of those first generation uh, attempts and trials and goals by a number of players to figure out what the challenges are to abate the concerns about safety and specificity and efficiency, and then really set the stage for more complex, multiplexed, in vivo, maybe even multi-gene targets, but we're just not there yet. Okay. Others on the panel want to add to that? Could you tell, maybe tell us a little bit, Oscar, about uh, where you guys are with, uh, with your work in hemophilia and uh, how that, um, that application? Yeah, maybe uh, I, I can start uh, giving you an overview and, and uh, build on, on some uh, key ideas that Rodolf just brought up. And this is the fact that from a clinician perspective, the key is to ensure safety. So this is our Hippocratic oath as, as doctors. So we uh, first do not harm. And we're dealing here with a technology that probably may, has still a number of unknowns. Uh, you, you, you mentioned, Rodolf, a moment, a moment ago, the focus that many companies are having on, on sickle cell therapy and uh, sickle cell disease. So, so this, is, this is a disease when you can manipulate the cells ex vivo. And this is extraordinarily important because this is one way where we really ensure safety. You are creating the therapeutic outside of the body. So you're doing all the manipulation. And once you are done with that, you put those cells back, these, uh, in this case, bone marrow stem cells into the individual, and they are going to do the job. And they, they, they are going to facilitate the fact that, for instance, sickle cell, that the, the majority of the blood cells are going to do their job of of uh, transporting oxygen uh, through the tissues and organs. Now, what we are doing and other companies are doing too is going in vivo. So that means that we're giving the actual, uh, we're uh, uh, using our genetic scissors in the body directly. So we are using uh, vectors. In our case, we use two a, uh, adenovirus associated uh, um, uh, viruses, which are harmless. And one of them uh, kind of does the cat, and another one uh, inserts the, the transgene that we're interested on. In, in our case, we are focusing on, 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 on the hepatocyte, uh, uh, the, the liver. And this is an area where uh, both in gene therapy and gene, gene editing, uh, we think that this is um, uh, an ideal target because we have a cell, which is the hepatocyte, which is a kind of biofactor. It has been used to, to, it produces hundreds of proteins and we can ask the cell to do the job for us. And that's the way we're, we're working with our transgene, which is different from others that have been already developed in the, in the clinic. And, and in our case, we have incorporated there's a 9% of sequences from, from, from the pig, porcine sequences that increase the synthesis and secretion of factor eight. Factor eight is the missing, missing bleeding uh, <clears throat> uh, coagulation factor in the, in, 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 in the, in the cascade. Uh, and, and it's absolutely essential in these individuals. So <clears throat> I, I just want to, to reiterate that uh, different companies specialize in certain areas. <clears throat> That's where, where we are. We are understanding also how the hepatocyte <clears throat> not only um, uh, has the transcription so that you, you get the, from, from the DNA to the RNA and then the protein. We also try to understand the fold, how these proteins are, the, the, in our case, factor is folded, is folded and released to, to, to the blood. 
So that's why we feel very confident. The fact that we have a gene therapy program, a standard th gene therapy program, including an episomal circular DNA and also the CRISPR therapy, give us the, this kind of understanding. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I think that this is very important also to understand. There is a, a, a big difference between gene therapy and gene editing in the sense that when we use gene therapy as such, we uh, uh, incorporate, we use with, with these viruses, with, with these delivery systems, uh, both the transgene and, and also a promoter, which is a, a, a regulatory uh, stretch of, of, of DNA that is going to activate the gene. When we do gene editing, we don't need this promoter. So we just uh, do the cut, put the gene, and put it very close to another promoter already in, in, in the genome of the individual, and that's the way the, the, the protein is, is generated. I think that's an interesting thing, that this is a very simple concept, but there's a big difference between what we call gene therapy and CRISPR therapies. And the way we do that, in, 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 in our case, is to identify the exact place where we have to insert the factor A transgene very close to the albumin promoter. So, so that the albumin, as you know, is one of the key proteins that we all have uh, circulating in our, our blood. So it has a very strong promoter. And we have to identify is it intron one, intron six, intron, intron eight, and how to do it. So that's, that's also part of the work. And I'm telling you all this because I'm uh, obviously joining all the R&D meetings from, from my team. And, and, and they're uh, telling us how they are doing that. So uh, again, uh, very important in, in, in an organization is to ensure that you have this institutional knowledge and you also learn from uh, opportunities like this, uh, how things are moving. And, and this is also important here in this business. Um, we, we, we're moving at, at warp speed. So every, everyone is bringing new information. We're hearing about news from the first uh, in vivo systemic therapy, which I think happened yesterday by Intelia in a uh, type of amyloidosis. So that, that's, that's one example. And Rudolf, you, 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 are you involved on this? Are you, are oh, yeah. You, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the a founder of the company. But He's a founder. Okay, then congratulations. <laughs> that, was, that was absolutely amazing. First time we hear about systemic in vivo therapy, and they are also targeting the liver. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, R rightfully so. The hepatocytes. So the, the delivery strategy, the modality, the target, the results. I mean, I've been waiting for those results to come back because I've seen all the in vivo work. It's very exciting. I think it's a game changer for sure. And and as a matter of fact, uh, within the day of that coming through, um, they just got a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And that was I heard that. I read that too. Yeah. So it's very exciting. It's a very exciting time for sure. Not just for Italia, but for everybody in the field. Yeah, and uh, Oscar, to build, I mean, you can see Oscar's enthusiasm and Rodolph enthusiasm. I love it, right? And, and, and let, let me just add a couple of things and build on what they were saying. You know, this has happened uh, so smoothly and you know, the transition has been so seamless here. We forget we're in the very early days of synthetic biology. We're not only editing, we're engineering proteins, we're engineering genes. We're engineering cells, we're engineering the immune system. And I think part of the fun, fun thing for us has been, and I think Oscar just started talking about this, was how do you put these tools together in novel ways, right? And that's what you're talking about, Oscar. So I think we're in the early days of that. Now, the, the, the two areas that I'm, a uh, couple of areas that I, I think that uh, I'm, I'm more familiar with, and actually Bruce is more familiar with the first one that I'm gonna talk about, which is allogeneic CAR-T. And maybe Bruce, you can build on uh, what, I, what I know. Uh, but this, this idea of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, these, the cell therapy, chimeric antigen receptor T cells, uh, these hybrid T cells, are, it's really interesting. Uh, most of the work that's being done is autologous. You have to use same person cells, but this uh, allogeneic approach uh, you can use gene editing to remove the uh, immunogenic elements so that you can avoid graft versus host disease. And this is a really big uh, improvement, and, and Bruce has been, uh, been a pioneer in that, and he can talk more about it. 
and, and Rudolf can talk more about the second one, uh, which is the, the work that came out of his lab for CRISPR-Cas3 and the antimicrobial work. Uh, Rudolf, I mean, the guys at Locus have done a tremendous job. I mean, even we have validation within the last few weeks of the grants that they won from uh, Carbex and, uh, and, 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 and the like. Uh, but but this, this is a huge unmet need when we're talking about CUTI, C. diff, E. coli, and all, all the other targets that they're going after. They've got just tremendous momentum, I, I believe. So I think that's another thing. The third thing doesn't come up as much, uh, but it's actually using CRISPR for diagnostic purposes. And we've seen a company that's uh, been doing a pretty good job in this, and which is Jen Jennifer Doudna's new company, Mam Mammoth Biosciences. And uh, so I think that th those are the three things that I know most about, and, and I think you guys probably know more about than I do, but those, those are the things that I think about. I mean, again, I, I could not agree more, um, and we could spend all day discussing this, right? So I think, I think the, the financial success, the CMC success, the, 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 the free clinical success that we see with Locus is very exciting, right? It, it's, just, it's an unmet need space. That's why Carbex money came in. That's why J&J &J money deals are big, and I think there's a lot of excitement. And, and it's, it's a modality that's underappreciated for a very significant unmet concerning need, right? So, so stars are aligning perfectly and, and, the, and the microbiome 2.0 engineering is really on, on the cusp here. Um, I think to your point about diagnostics, right? I mean, you couldn't be more timely with the pandemic, right? And, right. and I've written editorials in the CRISPR-J about how the CRISPR community has risen up to the challenge with regards to therapies, with regards to vaccines, obviously, and the Modernas and the like. And, and um, one of the, the, the Moderna founders is a fellow founder of Intelia. So those guys are solid, it's amazing. Um, and then obviously diagnostics. I think both Mammoth, as you pointed out, with Jennifer and Sherlock, with Fong, have shown with uh, unexpected speed, arguably, and scalability and financials that back that up, that we can have affordable, scalable, CRISPR-based detection for testing of infectious disease and viruses. And unless we test, and unless it's, we, you democratize testing, you know, it's gonna be very, very hard to really have the right numbers that we need to devise next quarter therapy. So I think, I think there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of modalities, there's a lot of potential. And here we're just talking about therapeutics, right? I mean, food and ag and forestry and sustainability, you know, it, it, notwithstanding, um, I think it's ushering a new era, and, and there's a lot of potential for sure. There's a lot of promise for sure, but we can't get too carried away or too confident. We still have, as Oscar said, to ensure safety, to ensure efficacy, and, and doing it right the way Italia has been patient. It took them years to get to that, to that announcement for yesterday. We have to do it right, because if we get it wrong, we're going to set the whole field back. And as we all know, right, the historians of gene therapies know historical shortcomings we've had in the past can really delay the progress of the field. So being careful, being mindful, going fast enough to address disease, but not so fast that we go a little too fast for safety is very important. And I think balancing that excitement with the right thing to do is, is, is important. But there's so many modalities, so many markets, therapies, diagnostics, antimicrobial, engineering CAR T's, it's almost limitless. And I, I've said before, the only limitation may be our imagination and funding. And I'm not sure which one's gonna be more limiting, but we'll discuss that in a minute, Q&A. So uh, thank you, Rodolph. And, and um, Bruce, I wanna get you in on this. I you know Shalef mentioned your expertise around CAR T. Uh, you can talk a little bit about that, but I think also Rodolph kind of jumped into what I thought would be maybe part of the next discussion, which is, you know, what are the challenges that we've just got to make sure that we're addressing? I think one that everybody knows, and, and Oscar and I have actually had conversations about this, uh, you know, with our uh, kind of personal relationship as we talk, but, you know, the one that everybody starts talking about is, is off-target events, but there are other things that we have to take into account. So I'd like to open it up, uh, Bruce, maybe speak a little bit about your experience with, uh, with gene editing around CAR-T, but also if you wanted to speak to what are the things we really need to be aware of and, and, and be responsible for is making sure that, you know, these are safe and, and appropriate uh, therapies to bring forth to patients and other applications. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, uh, okay, so there, there's a host of things, so I was reserving my comments until we got to this next next stage. <laughs> so no doubt, um, 
it, it's, it's, it's the tip of the iceberg. It's amazing how fast uh, different companies are moving with different technologies. So CRISPR-Cas, some are using talons to do gene editing. Uh, precision biosciences using a homing endonuclease to do our gene editing. Uh, but in each case, you have some of the same challenges and, and there are some regulatory challenges now. The agency has literally created a new division or just renamed a division that is trying to keep up with the speed of these technologies from a regulatory standpoint to ensure product consistency and product safety. Uh, one of those you mentioned is off-targeting. Um, I don't, it doesn't matter whether you're using a guide-based system like a CRISPR that uses a guide RNA to target a non-specific nuclease to where it wants it to cut, uh, or homing into nuclease like precision uses where the, where the nuclease itself is an engineered protein that specifically is engineered to recognize only one sequence of DNA within the human chromosome and cut only that DNA. That's, that sounds easy to do uh, in theory, and we think, gee whiz, you know, we all know about you know, RNA and DNA hybrids and matching, but in fact, a single base pair difference, a single nucleotide polymorphism can determine the difference between cutting the target, not cutting the target, or cutting an unintended target. And of course, making random cuts, double strand breaks in DNA, it's not a good thing for cells. It's toxic, number one. Number two, uh, bad things can happen. So the agency has uh, a pretty strict set of um, guidelines and, and technologies that we have to use, everyone has to use, to demonstrate the specificity uh, of our gene editing, to make sure that we're cutting where we intended to cut and not where we didn't. Um, the good news there is some of these technologies, again, have, have come up so quickly that all companies now know what to do and how to demonstrate to the FDA, and the FDA has even started to set specific um, regulation in terms of you know, X percent, 0 0.001, whatever it is, percent is considered acceptable and safe. The other thing I think is very interesting and where I thought this conversation was kind of going was the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges right now is delivery. So as Shellis mentioned, um, in adoptive cell therapies, such as CAR T cell therapies, whether that's autologous, meaning the starting cell comes from the patient themselves, you, you pull it out of the body, you, you engineer it, you give it back or what we're doing at Precision, which is to make it more widely available to anyone, an off-the-shelf therapy that you can give to any patient. That's an allogeneic cell therapy. That requires gene editing to not only put a new receptor in to target, let's say, a cancer cell, which is what you're doing in autologous, but in the case of allogeneic, we also have to gene edit to remove the receptor that's already on that T cell to prevent graft versus host disease, for instance, as Shellis mentioned. And what's, what's really, I think, moving the field forward that I, and, and many are doing it now, is what we started, and we, we published this in 2018 in molecular therapy, is doing a targeted insertion of the new transgene that you want to introduce into the cell, while at the same time knocking out the expression of the gene you don't want expressed in that cell. So in the case of uh, CAR T cell therapies, allogeneic, we're knocking out the expression of an endogenous T cell receptor, and we're knocking in the new CAR receptor at that very site. That's important because we now know in every cell, there's only one copy and we know how, where it's being expressed from. And we can control the expression by either using our own promoter to drive that CAR transgene, or as you heard Oscar say, we can actually steal the endogenous promoter and let that drive the expression of the gene. And what we're finding is sometimes that really matters because cells normally regulate themselves. And when you knock in a foreign transgene and express it with your own promoter, you may or may not impact the natural regulation of the cell and therefore alter its intended function. So that's a new technology. To, well, some to, we've always done that precision, but a lot of people are doing that now using AAV vectors, as you heard Oscar mention. So we can build what are called homology arms into our AAV vectors, meaning either side of the transgene. And those homology arms are, are designed to target exactly where you want to insert that transgene, which sits between those homology arms of the AAV. And what that does is it tells the cell, oh, you want me to repair this break in my DNA, and you're showing me a template, a repair template that's homologous to that part of DNA. And so it uses the homologous repair mechanism to repair it, as opposed to the other mechanism that yeah, eukaryotic cells use called non-homologous end joining, which may prevent expression of a gene but it also can do some other bad things. Um, and it certainly will not allow you to do a targeted uh, insertion. So that's really exciting technology. One of the things I wanted to get into because I thought it would be good for your, 
for anyone who's listening today, though, is as you heard Rodolph say, it, we're just going at light speed. Okay. What's the problem now is for, the, for everyone in this business, the global supply chains are, are just overwhelmed. They can't keep up. So manufacturing times now are taking longer and longer. There are these queues. It can be six, nine months, for instance, to make a viral vector that you need to either deliver an in vivo gene therapy or to do an ex vivo cell therapy or gene manipulation like you saw for the intelli in the sickle cell. This is a problem. It's a problem for everybody. If you're a really big company like Bristol Myers Squibb, who bought you know, Celgene, who bought Juno, right, just to get all of this, you build a manufacturing plan, but that's, that's a hundred million dollar investment. Uh, that's yeah. difficult for many other companies to do. So both vector manufacturing, plasma DNA manufacturing, the global supply chains have got to try to keep up because the science and the, and the, and the clinical products is moving faster than they can keep up with. Uh, another interesting um, change is delivery. So if you're into the in vivo gene therapy, which is what we just heard Rodolf and Oscar talk a little bit about, the question is, if you have to do your gene therapy in vivo, not take a cell out of the body and engineer it and give it back, actually put your vector into that person and that vector needs to go to the intended cell and make that, that change at the intended cell. This is a challenge. It's one of the reasons why in gene therapy, we all are initially targeting the liver because that's, that's normally where, you know, portal vein circulation is gonna dump into the liver anyway. So delivering to the liver is not as difficult as delivering to some other specific targeted cells. And so one of the new things, Aspire was an example of a company that's been doing this, others are doing it, is engineering the vectors that have targeted chimeric binding proteins on their surface that therefore can specifically target the intended cells you want to edit. For instance, let's say it's a neuron, uh, or let's say it's a, you know, a muscle cell. So I think that's a new way that's really gonna open up some, some other new gene therapies that are gonna be very, uh, very important in terms of the ability to target only the cells you need to target, and therefore also not need such huge quantities of the virus, because as I just mentioned, that's a precious commodity in the supply chain globally, can't keep up right now. And the okay. other thing I think is very exciting is for people to understand the difference between gene editing, meaning using a nuclease, a, a CRISPR-Cas, an, um, an ARCUS nuclease in the case of precision, introducing a double strand break in DNA that must be repaired. And so we have to provide it a template to repair it. But also we're learning now to use gene editing technology. What if we don't want to introduce double strand breaks in DNA? We wanna change how the DNA is being expressed. We wanna change how it's being regulated. So this is, this is new, companies are doing it, Precision's doing it as well. We can actually make these nucleases to where we're not asking them to make double strand breaks, we're asking them to bind to specific places and change how a gene is being expressed. So it's an epigenetic play. Many diseases are not diseases because you have a faulty gene. They become diseases because the product of that gene is not being regulated correctly. It's being overexpressed or not expressed enough. So this is yet another area that I think is very exciting that I'm really looking forward to uh, in the future of the whole field. Okay, Thank, thanks Bruce. And, and it, it kind of feeds into, because you know, Oscar, you're living this. You guys are, are in the process of bringing a, uh, a therapeutic forward. So you're living some of these challenges and, and the ideas of where you're going to be doing it uh, across the, you know, the world. So any comments to follow up as far as uh, how you guys are addressing these challenges to, uh, to deal with everything that takes to commercialize and eventually get the, uh, the, this therapeutic to patients around the world? So in general, clinical developer, developers in, in biopharma or biotechs uh, are, uh, are involved in the so-called translational medicine. When I was a kid, everyone, every time I received a toy, it lasted about six hours. After that, it was, I pulled it apart and looked into everything inside it. And I did the same when I came into, in, 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 into AC Therapeutics. I noticed that I needed to learn more than usual. So I, I needed that I needed to understand how CRISPR works, how gene therapy works, and also understand the context of our drug product. That's not usual in our business. 
and and uh, especially for I've been working with small molecules for cardiovascular diseases. I've been working with um, uh, biologics such as monoclonal antibodies when I was working with the Humira team at AB. And and but when you go into gene and, and, CRISP, uh, and CRISPR therapies there is an exponential level of scientific and even manufacturing understanding, which are absolutely crucial. So when you make a decision on drug safety and on a study design for your upcoming phase one trial, in our case, I need to really be embedded within the R&D and CMC teams. I need to understand how uh, they're doing their work with first cell cultures, then moving into animal models, which are very simple animal models as we're starting with mice. Then we go to so-called humanized mice that have the genome, the human genome, and finally to non-human primates, monkeys. And it's extremely important for me to get and understand how things are working there. For instance, let me give you an example of something that one of our most recent meetings, our R&D team was talking about finding a guide RNA, which is a, a stretch of 20 base pairs that are going to be the GPS uh, uh, finding that place where they are going to do the cut. We expect that that cut is going to happen in certain place uh, in near this album in locus, as I mentioned, to insert the transgene for factor eight, but it can go somewhere else. So how do we know that before we go into humans? One way is to understand or to look for a guide RNA, these 20 by spares, that also would work in a monkey. So if we, if we do that and we're working on, on, on finding that uh, guide RNA, we're going to start, we haven't started with our work in monkeys, but if we do that in that way, we may find off target effects and, and potentially safety signals. So that's something that is, that, is, that is an example of how important it is because this is the data that we're going to be showing to the regulatory agencies. So this is ex extremely important. And by the way, the regulatory agencies are now putting a lot of pressure in gene therapy and CRISPR therapeutic companies because they are asking us, okay, nice, you did that, the patient is doing well, but how long should we uh, follow up these patients? Is it two years? Now they are asking for a minimum of five years, probably more, and imagine how the payers are going to look at that. So they're, they're not simply taking uh, uh, your, your therapeutic and, and putting that in patients and paying you $2 million. I can give you an example from my home country in Spain. They, they have decided on certain gene therapies that they, they pay in two installments. Installment number one is when you give the therapy and they wait 18 months to pay the second installment. That's minimum. So that's one example of the complexity of, of this business in terms of of uh, regulatory aspects, commercial aspects, and, and definitely R and D and, and, and scientific aspects. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to opine on this again. We could talk about this all day, but I think I think that in the context of CRISPR, right? This is what CRISPR has done. It used actually to be hard to do the cut, right? Notwithstanding great Arcus technology and ZFNs and talons and meganucleases, I mean, it used to be hard. You, need, you had to be an expert with money and teams and knowledge and expertise to be able to do it. And what CRISPR has changed is it's almost trivialized that, right? So what this has done is just move the bottleneck. And now the bottleneck is somewhere else. Whether it's in AV manufacturing, as we heard from Bruce, or we just heard from Oscar, like guide RNA selection, right? Picking the best guide. You have no idea how much effort went into that, that seemingly trivial part from, from Intelia, right? I mean, hundreds of guides were tested for each target. And looking at guide efficiency, guide specificity, guide safety, I mean, just unbelievable, right? So, so it's changed the game to some extent, but it's also raised the bar. And that's the, one of the prices that we have to pay from a regulatory standpoint is that, well, you know, if that's all we could do until now, the bar is low, you know? And, and it's a good thing, but it's also a challenging thing that CRISPR has raised the bar, it has, yielded a rise in demand. It has created a shortcoming in supply chain for CMC and manufacturing and AAV. And it's good in the sense that it's moving along, right? But the challenge now means where are the bottlenecks and how can they be addressed? And I think, you know, strategy, right? I mean, Kineticos, like business strategy, right? I'm not, not being paid or endorsement here, but like going into AAV manufacturing, 
and understanding where the bottlenecks are and where the next frontier is going to be to enable people to bring that to an FDA approved reality and consumer impacting technology is the challenge that is before us now, right? It used to be, can you cut? Can you make an edit? Can you even deliver it in vivo and have some hope? And the answer is yes, we know that now, but the bottlenecks are different and the tech is great, the toolbox is great, the opportunities are great, but knowing where the challenges are, knowing where the pressure points are, and knowing how to debottleneck those elements is where the next generation of successful companies are gonna be made, or where the next generation of high expectation failures are gonna happen, it's people who don't understand the intricacies of the business behind it with manufacturing and financials and regulatory and, and the science, obviously, on top of that, or maybe at the very beginning of it. Yeah, and, and Rudolph, interesting enough, uh, coming out of the the audience, that's a question that's being asked. I'll go ahead and bring it in. Is you know what is happening with outsourced CDMO production solutions? Are they understanding this? Uh, what are the things that are being done right now to meet those com- uh, capacity issues? and kind of implement a strategy to get ahead of the curve. Um, I'll throw that out to everybody. I don't know, Shalash, is that something yeah. you can take? Because I know yeah, you spent let, some time on this. Yeah, let me, let me start off by saying that, uh, you know, uh, the capacity that we need, and, you know, and Bruce started talking about it, but viral vector manufacturing, development and manufacturing is one of the biggest areas uh, on the cell therapy side. But the capacity needed for all these synthetic biology approaches, we only have about 5% of the capacity that we need in the next five years. The FDA estimates gene and cell therapies and all these synthetic biology approaches are gonna yield 10 new therapeutics a year for the next five years. We only have 5% of the capacity. And, and what's happening in the CDMO business is that smaller companies are getting bought by larger companies. So last year, Thermo bought uh, uh, Brammer, which I was an advisor there, investor there, and then Catalet uh, bought Paragon. And what you're, it's, it's, it's a absolute gold rush out there. There was a company called Polyplus, which makes uh, reagents for uh, viral vector manufacturing. They sold for 50X of their EBITDA. And uh, uh, Wilbur Pincus bought them in France. We did diligence for another company on that. So it's, it's a gold rush out there. There's not enough capacity. And that make versus buy decision is absolutely critical. Do you make it yourself, meaning that you develop your own uh, CDMO, uh, not CDMO, man, internal development and manufacturing, you go with somebody else. The problem right now in the industry is uh, you can't go anywhere right now. It, it, it's going to take me 18 months before I would actually, and for a small little biotech like me or, or anybody that's small, you're not going to get their attention either. So not only can you get in, it's not going to be a priority. The, from, a, from a strategy perspective, uh, one of the things that we know is that uh, building development, internal development, and manufacturing capability is value accretive. And I cannot say this enough. It takes a real skill set to be able to do this. It's value accretive. And a perfect example, and Bruce brought this, these guys up before, is Ask Bio down the street. They sold a week ago, a week and a half ago for $4 billion, $2 billion up front, $2 billion on the back end. Yes, they've got some great programs, but mainly, I mean, a big part of it is they've got their own development and manufacturing, yeah. and they're not bottlenecked by it. Uh, uh, otherwise, they're a virtual uh, gene therapy company, right? And they're not going to be, they're not worth $4 billion. But you had a buyer that wanted to get into it that was not familiar with the pharma market. So... This is, very, this is a very, very important point. We don't have the capacity. The other thing related to capacity is we don't have the talent pool. I cannot emphasize how important this is. We don't need PhDs for everything. We need PhDs for R&D. We don't need PhDs for manufacturing. And, and my belief is that the blue collar jobs of the 21st century are the biomanufacturing jobs. You don't need a PhD. You don't need a master's. You don't need a, you don't need a bachelor's degree. You need people who are going to be trained from the community colleges on how to follow processes and do them repeatedly. Those are loyal workers. And I think we have, you know, we have uh, uh, a, a mandate from our shareholders to explore that, but we also have a moral ethical mandate to do that. I, I, again, I could not agree more with everything that's been said here. Shalesh, spot on for the taxpayer of North Carolina's money hard at work at NC State and our community college network 
the whole UNC system and on and on and on. And as a matter of fact, I think this is one of the main reasons why the, the short-term, mid-term, and long-term outlook is so good for RTP. And it is. You can see here, right? So again, yeah. reaching the, 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 the Shalesh gospel here for sure. Um, <laughs> but I, I want to go back to, to the evidence. Well, hold on one second. I, I, am I am today announcing my plans to run for governor in 2024. <laughs> you got my vote, right? You're a little late. You might have you might have won this year. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, but but the point the point here is that uh, Rodolph is that our, in North Carolina we do have this nexus. We've got Aspio. We got Novartis. We have Avaxis. We have Merck. We've got this nexus here, and I know that the community here is really really focused on this. My goal, my thing is bring in non traditional workers into this workforce through the community colleges through the work that you're doing, and I think that it's very possible. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rolf. Yeah. Something I, I wanted to jump in on, but on, on this is that um, you're absolutely correct, Shalesh, and, and we recognize that position too. So we built a manufacturing facility, and to Rodolf's point, right there in RTP, it's, it, it, it was the building that used to be Stifle. It was, it was GSK's old, and, and there is technology now. So there there is a light at the end of this tunnel of this backlog. There are clean room technologies now that are nowhere near as expensive. It, it isn't like the old days that when you were you know, putting $100 million into building a huge manufacturing plant. We can literally have these self-contained clean room type technologies that we can run a, a manufacturing campaign every 10 days, go through the GMP process of full clean replace and then wash, rinse, repeat, and then crank it again. So you don't have the same huge space requirements and you get better use out of your capital equipment. So it's not as expensive as it was. And I think that your comment about the value of creative is spot on. It's still a lot. It's, it's still $20 million or yeah, so. Yeah, it's, it's $20 million for sure. But, yeah, um, minimum. Yeah, it's something we need to do. And the other point I want to make here, one of the things that I am, um, and you mentioned Aspio, I, mean, uh, I had this discussion with Jude Simulski, the same thing is, look, the most expensive part of manufacturing any of these therapies are these viral vectors, whether it's ex vivo cell therapy or in vivo gene therapy. If we, some of, there are some new technologies now, you know, we're looking at some, everyone's looking at some, you know, um, directed lipid nanoparticle deliveries, for instance, non-viral transduction. Non-viral right? electroporation, non-viral, these are all- electro Cell don't like to be electroporated, but even that technology, as you know from Max I don't know you know that company, you know, they, they really advanced the field. Yes, there's a bottleneck now, but I also think there's light at the end of the tunnel. And this is where the innovation comes from. And those companies that are looking ahead three years and saying, you know, we, we're not going to, I mean, Precision, we put three products into the clinic in five years as a company of only 200 people. Yeah. Talk about going at light speed. But, but we've got more in the pipe <laughs> that we still want to put in. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and we're moving as fast as we can and scouring the world and having our own capacity. But these are all good things because, um, as Rodolph said earlier on, I think we're just scratching the surface. Hey guys, I, I, I hate to jump in here. We're up against probably the last 10 minutes and we were trying to give some time. There are some questions, but I want to give everybody a chance on the last question and then um, maybe a last statement is just, you know, where do you see us going? Just a couple comments maybe about the future of CRISPR and gene editing in general. And then what would be a couple key takeaways, you know, if, if you shared with the audience, these are a couple of things I want everybody to think about as, as far as key takeaways. Um, can I start with Shalesh and then maybe move, move across the audience or move across the panelists? Yeah, I'll move really quickly. And I'm going to do the one that uh, Rodolph uh, alluded to earlier, uh, which, which is, look, guys, uh, that we've got ethical challenges here. Everybody knows what they are. In some of these cases, uh, we're talking about germline modification, and this has serious uh, uh, moral uh, and societal impact. Uh, so I think that that's that's a big challenge that that needs to be resolved. And I don't think I think it's obvious what needs to be done, but it's not it's difficult to do. Uh, societal challenges, yeah, we have to we have to be able. We've got people who say they won't take the COVID vaccine. That's what we've got. Uh, and then, then you're going to say, okay, well, we're going to put a molecular scissors in you to cut out the gene that prevents you from X. Okay, all right, let's 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 see how that works. So we have these societal challenges. It's a monumental communications problem. I know, Rodolph, you're working on this. You've got a movie coming out and all that. 
So uh, it's already out, sorry. Uh, and then translate that into policy and regulations uh, and make sure that, that the governments around the world really understand what the situations are because, uh, and, to, you know, and, and I think scientists have to lead in that. And I think you're gonna see in the next four years, the ascendancy of science once again. And we've taken a backseat for the last, take a big hit in the last few years, but we're gonna see that come back again. And lastly, I'll leave you with is that, um, that we are stewards. The people on this call are stewards and our responsibility and we, we, have, we have our job to be have responsible stewards for this technology that is adopted properly. Thank you, Shalash. Can I go to Bruce next? Yeah, sure. Um, I, again, I, I don't want to take up other people's time since I've been doing a good bit of the talk oh. in the last 15 minutes. But I, I'm, I personally still remain very excited about this technology. Um, I think, as we've heard, the, the new horizon, especially in, in something like a CRISPR, is in really getting to very clever, smart designs of guides. Something we didn't talk about today is multiplexing. Yeah. So it, it's fine if you have a monogenetic disease to correct one defective gene. What, what when you have, like most diseases, what, what when there are multiple things that need to be corrected? And this is where I say, I can tell you from experience, and it doesn't matter which gene editing tool you're using, Cells don't like having their DNA broken and repairing their DNA. And the more you do it from a manufacturing perspective, the more you lose yield due to poor cell viability. It's hard to get these nucleases, especially something as, as large as CRISPR-Cas, into cells in more than one copy. And so that's, again, why I'm very excited. I think the next wave is going to be manipulating the genome from an epigenetic perspective where we don't have to introduce multiple nucleases and make multiple DNA double strand breaks to affect what will, what will amount to a multiplex correction. Okay, thanks Bruce. Uh, Oscar, a couple thoughts on what's coming and key takeaways? Yeah, I, I, I would focus on, on the challenge that Shailesh just mentioned. And this is, this is the ethical issue. And uh, if you put that in, in the perspective of a clinical developer or someone that needs to start consenting patients, getting patients in our clinical trials, you have all the issues that Shailesh just, just mentioned, but uh, not only people are afraid of uh, RNA, COVID vaccines, they also talk about even GMO foods. So how are we going to tell the society that we have a new technology that is going to help many, many patients. And I think that we, are, we should all uh, work on that together. We need to make sure, for instance, that something as simple as understanding the difference between germline therapies, which, is the, which are the ones that can cause ch changes in reproductive cells, egg, sperm, and versus somatic changes. That is what we are doing. And something as simple as that should be part of the, I would say, um, school education so that we get new generations that really understand that and molecular biology today is not the one I learned 30 years ago. So uh, I, I think that's the point where I, I would like to, to, to reiterate here. Okay, thanks Oscar. Rodolph, I, I, I wanted to end with you on purpose, uh, your thoughts, but also I was going to give you a chance to plug a couple things because I know you've got a couple things that are coming out I think people would be interested in hearing about. Yeah, I mean, again, I think I appreciate that for sure. Uh, I wasn't sure what order I was going to go in. So, you know, if you're curious about all those things, check out Human Nature on Netflix, as Shilash pointed out. It discusses this a lot. And it was done for that very reason, right? We have a burden of stewardship of that technology. As a member of multiple national academies, right? I mean, we have to promote the acceptance of science and provide informed decision. I've talked to Congress, I've talked to the White House, past, hopefully future. I mean, we have a, a duty of care and a duty of education across the whole world at a time of anti-science skepticism, anti-science bias, anti-GM technology. It's, it's, it's dumbfounding, but we have to rise to the task. And that's where the Nobel is gonna to help too. So, so to promote acceptance by the public is not our number one challenge today, right? Number two, you know, this is a business panel too. The future of CRISPR is going to be MNA. You know, which ones and where and what space for what bottleneck? Is it going to be tech? Is it going to be manufacturing? Is it going to be regulatory? Is it going to be expertise? Is it going to be the CRISPR toolbox? Is it going to be epigenetics, prescriptomes, and whatnot? Who knows? 
And then notwithstanding the therapeutic focus today, I would urge everyone to think, and we just heard about GMO with Oscars in, in food, right? I mean, think, you know, CRISPR times impossible food. Think using CRISPR to feed the world, right? There's a couple hundred million people that can benefit from CRISPR therapeutically, but there's like 8 billion of us who could benefit from a CRISPR edited forest that's healthier or enhance food sustainability, right? And that's what we work on, a lot of people work on. And to that point, Bruce, we have 13 plex genome editing working in Poplar. And they're 10 feet tall in a greenhouse in you know, Raleigh, North Carolina. So I think- I was gonna say, we do that at Precision. Yeah, we have a company called Ello Life Sciences, which was the plant science division, which is how the company started. And you're absolutely right. There's a situation where you can multiplex it all you want. And so there, that's a wonderful application of where we don't have the same issue we do with in vivo human editing. Yeah, so I think, I think it's, there's a lot of excitement to be had. It's the beginning, but now we've changed the challenge to societal acceptance, to business, wise business investments, right? Kinetical strategy at work um, and, and educating the, the workforce that we need to do the work because we have a lot ahead of us and it's exciting, uh, but we have to rise to the task for sure. You're on mute, Philip. Let me get off of mute. Thank you, Rodolfo. I, we do have some questions. I know we're up against time, but uh, I think even when I was talking to the panelists, we told uh, each other that an hour was not enough time for this. So maybe we'll even come back and talk about this at a later date, all the, the things we didn't get to. One of the questions I thought I would bring to everybody came from Glenn Block, and he was saying, you know, look, we're excited about the potential. A lot of comments on early programs, but there's some issues around safety. You know, the whole category could get hit if we don't do it right. Trailblazing companies. Uh, are taking a stance on what their strategic decisions are in respect to how they move forward. Pricing and reimbursement may be part of this. Uh, the question really comes down is, should these early players in the industry come together and have some type of thought process on how we can standardize approaches, not only for the benefit of the industry and this technology and its application, but for the, for the patients? Any comments on that? In fact, we already are. Okay. So, I mean, I, I was invited and in, in participated in a panel two years ago in the UK that included authorities from the EMA, the European, you know, regulatory uh, authorities from the different uh, regions, uh, the US FDA, and then various experts from, you know, um, uh, the industry. Now, this was more focused at the time on CAR-T, but one of the things we did <clears throat> and the regulatory agencies have taken this into consideration uh, from a safety perspective, was we pointed out that the current requirement to follow patients for 15 years is impossible to do, number one, to follow patients for 15 years. And it's especially difficult if you're in Europe and patients move between countries quite often. And the concern from the FDA was this idea of insertional mutagenesis, which really applies only to lentiviral and retroviral vectors anyway. And we got together and we showed them data with over 1,600 patient years of follow-up from all of the lentian and retroviral-based CAR-T products, which started, you know, Novartis, Penn, Juno, Kite, et cetera, and not one case of a tumor being uh, arising in a patient as a result of a CAR-T product being given to that patient has occurred. And I think the agencies are starting to look and hear more about this data and make it, you know, such that a, a, a regulatory requirement um, shouldn't be a requirement if it's going to be exceedingly difficult to adhere to and also if it doesn't serve the intended purpose. So the more that we have data, the more that we have clinical follow-ups, and the more that the players in the industry get together at these scientific advice meetings, what they're called these panel meetings, the more I think the regulations are also going to keep up with the pace of these, these new therapies. Just, just one idea of just building on what, what you just said, Bruce. And this is that the regulatory uh, agencies are really taking that role. They're creating guidances that are extraordinarily detailed. We, I ha we have a 14-page guidance from January this year for hemophilia A gene therapy, exclusively for that. So I guess that there are other for other for other indications. So this standardization is taking is taking place already. Okay. Any other comments? 
Okay, I think the, the only other question I'd, I'd like to get to before we get off, you know, it's um, we're, we're starting to see some differentiation and, and hopefully, uh, I apologize, uh, hopefully I'm saying this correctly, differentiation, uh, transitioning from hardware, in other words, the right guide RNA to a software approach, programmable RNA, uh, mRNA to edit in sequence. Um, to what extent are we seeing that uh, that move, and how is it going to change the way that we approach what we're doing in this uh, in this space? Rodolph, is that something yeah. we do? So, so I think I think for the first generation genome editors, maybe some of the the tools are you know being put to good use, and the and the bottlenecks are you know the, the software. But I still think there's a lot of hard based tools that need to be worked on for delivery, for efficiency. We heard about guides. We heard about AAV manufacturing. So I think I think there's still a lot of toolbox enhancement that needs to go there. And to something Bruce said again earlier, we could talk about this for days. Um, you know, beyond genome editing, controlling the transcriptome, controlling the epigenome, I mean, the tools are going to need some sharpening still. So I think, I think tool enhancement, toolbox diversification, same with diagnostics, as Chilas mentioned too, there's a lot of things in the toolbox that need to be diversified, enhanced, and sharpened. So the, the, the hardware itself and the software both need substantial amount of progress to get to the full extent of harnessing the potential that we had before. So I understand that and agree with that to some extent for first generation products. And again, we've only cured a handful of patients, right? <laughs> Just the beginning here. Um, so I think there's some truth to that, but to me, both need substantial amount of work for years to come to uh, fully explore what we have before us. Okay. Well, guys, I'm going to have to cut it off here. We're, we're definitely at the hour. As I said, there's probably more content here. We could do at least two other calls on this, and maybe we will do that. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank the panelists for doing this and joining us. I think it was a very interesting and uh, very uh, insightful, but uh, very, as, as I think Shalesh maybe made the comment, very passionate discussion. I think all of these individuals have direct uh, connection into what uh, gene editing and CRISPR can mean to the future of, of uh, both therapeutics, but also impacting uh, patients' lives. So thank you again to all the panelists. Uh, Want to thank all of those who uh, joined us today on this panel discussion. Uh, look for us to actually put out promotion on upcoming panel discussions. We'll be holding over uh, at least one, if not two a month. And you might actually see that we're going to come back around to this because, like I said, there's a lot of content here. So everybody have a great uh, rest of your day, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay,